Good morning, everybody. It is my pleasure today to introduce one of our very own, Dr. Mark Reisman. So Dr. Reisman received his undergraduate degree from Stony Brook University and then went on to complete his medical degree from Sackler School of Medicine. He uh, did his training in internal medicine at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital in New York before moving out to sunny Southern California, as he was telling me, to do his fellowship training uh, at, University of, at UCSD along with his interventional cardiology fellowship. He moved up to Seattle after staying there on faculty for several years, where he worked at Swedish Medical Center, um, directing their cardiac cath lab, as well as uh, the medical director for cardiovascular research and education. He is still the chief scientific officer there, but is now also a clinical professor of medicine here at the University of Washington. And he is the section head of interventional cardiology here and the director of structural heart services at the Regional Heart Center. He has, uh, his contribution to research is quite vast, he has been the site uh, primary investigator on over 80 clinical trials and a national primary investigator on numerous clinical trials, including, um, as I was looking through his resume, the closure, the closure One trial, which was published in the New England Journal in 2012, which looked, compared percutaneous closure of pain and foramen ovale to medical therapy in patients with stroke or TIA. He has also published over 60 other articles in the cardiology literature and has been the author on over 20 book chapters. So please help me welcome Dr. Reisman as he gives his talk today entitled Structural Heart Disease, Evolution of Medical Device Therapy. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Rachel. I appreciate the introduction. And uh, so what I'll hopefully do in the next hour is, uh, is uh, show you some of the new and uh, interesting, interesting things in structural heart disease. Uh, it's a vast topic and uh, I'm the only one to blame for this because I actually chose the topic. So uh, I, I have to uh, acknowledge that at least. Uh, in terms of disclosure, I, I do do some uh, research with some of the companies you'll see, but I personally uh, don't have any financial uh, relationship with, uh, with these companies. So in terms of the objectives of the, of the next uh, 45 minutes, um, what I'd like to do is give you the state of the art in cardiovascular device therapy. Uh, it will be all plumbing. There will be no electrical stuff. So I'm a uh, non-electrophysiologist, you'll notice. I'll give you the description of several devices uh, that really uh, have brought together a, a large number of multidisciplinary teams uh, in terms of uh, adequately uh, managing people, uh, uh, patients for success uh, and out best outcomes. And really, the current data supporting or limiting some of this uh, device uh, utilization. And um, what I'm going to do is, because I have so many uh, topics to cover, uh, what I like to do is um, show a lot of pictures and, and uh, cadaver specimens and perfusion models and a bunch of other um, methods in which we have been teaching other colleagues how to do these procedures. And then these two gentlemen uh, who were on this uh, picture, one was from 1928, that was uh, Dr. Forsman, who, uh, who basically did his own uh, catheterization uh, through his vein. and. Uh, and basically was the first one to stick a, a, a tube into, uh, <coughs> into the heart. He was promptly fired. Uh, <laughs> obviously didn't have a good HR department. Or, uh <laughs> and then uh, under that is Dr. Soans, um, who in 1958 um, uh, did the first uh, uh, selective coronary uh, angiography, which uh, was by mistake. Uh, he was doing a aortography, and the, uh, the actual catheter just slipped into the right coronary artery. And, uh, and that's how he, uh, he began selective coronary angiography. Uh, never, never, always have faith in those little uh, sort of strange developments that uh, occur. So uh, in terms of device development, uh, it's usually around addressing unmet needs. Uh, for example, we have now um, a left atrial appendage occlusion device, uh, which I'll be showing you. That's uh, a method in, in order to close off or occlude the left atrial appendage in the heart uh, to reduce stroke. And then there are other devices that have been developed uh, that convert surgical open procedures to minimally invasive or transcatheter procedures. And those are basically to either reduce morbidity or to expand access to patients. And one of those uh, that I'm sure most of you have heard of is the, the TAVR procedure, which is the transcatheter aortic valve uh, procedure. So, so for some who have not been living in my world, uh, what we're doing now is we're actually replacing people's valves through catheters uh, that go up from the arteries and the leg. And I'll show you a whole bunch of those and, and, uh, and uh, demonstrate that. And then another device 
uh, is called the mitral clip, and that's a device to actually um, reduce uh, mitral insufficiency by actually clipping the valve. And uh, actually, uh, just in clinic yesterday, we had a patient come in who uh, was being seen by me for a mitral clip, and uh, the MA asked, uh, why are you here for? And she said, uh, I'm here for a clipping. So, uh, <laughs> so if this doesn't work out for me, I think uh, I could always open a nail salon or something like that. <laughs> so I'll go through these uh, pictures and show you. So the, uh, this is uh, sort of the classic anatomical <coughs> surgical view. And uh, I guess you could say my entire life over the last decade has been somewhere uh, in this picture. Um, the centerpiece of the heart is clearly the aortic valve. And we're doing a lot of work in aortic stenosis and transcatheter aortic stenosis. Here behind it, you see a very nice picture of the mitral valve, the anterior leaflet, and the posterior leaflet. And we can talk a little bit about that. And then you see the septum. Rachel mentioned our work we did with uh, PFO. Um, I won't mention much about that today because that trial was negative, and we're trying to understand that a little bit better. Not that it's negative that uh, that was a bad thing, but right now we're just trying to understand the difference between um, mechanical and, and medical therapy for that indication of stroke from a cryptogenic stroke. And then here you see the uh, left atrial appendage. I already mentioned that. Uh, for that, we're putting in a, a large number of devices, different devices, in order to occlude it. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, during the rest of the program. The methods that we use is uh, a perfusion model. Um, we've been doing this at the Seattle Science Foundation. Now we're building the models here at the University of Washington. And the idea is to use these types of models not only to, uh, to teach cardiologists anatomy, <laughs> which is hard to believe, but uh, attitudinal anatomy of the heart is very complex, especially when you're looking at a, a fluoroscopic or x-ray uh, picture. And also, um, we're using these models to work with industry to, to develop these devices. And really, it's been a great opportunity. And, and a lot of the companies have, have come to work with us. And, and what it does really is it accelerates um, uh, device um, iteration. And frankly, it, it probably um, saves lives, because a lot of the early de device designs do not go into first demand trials anymore. They come to us. And I'll show you some of the work we've done uh, and how we've uh, really think we've benefited uh, uh, patients quite a bit. So let's start with the, uh, the mitral clip. And before we start with the, the mitral clip, uh, let's just go over the anatomy a little bit. So again, we talked about the, uh, the posterior leaflet, which is circumferentially the, the larger of the two leaflets as it, as it goes around the uh, mitral annulus. Here's the uh, anterior leaflet, as you can see. The uh, posterior leaflet is scalloped, and the uh, anterior leaflet is non-scalloped. And we just use, we, we name them a P1 and uh, A1, uh, depending on their location. But essentially, the scallops predominantly exist on the posterior leaflet. And here you see, uh, we just colorized it, and you see the big anterior leaflet. Almost, people say it looks like a tongue, and then the posterior leaflet here. And what we try to do with the mitral clip is actually bring uh, the leaflets together, the anterior and posterior leaflets together, in order that um, we can um, make them co co-op closer and reduce uh, regurgitation. And these are some of the pictures I'll be showing, as you can see in the bottom right here corner, um, watching the valve work in a, a perfusion model um, with the, um, with the uh, advantage of having a video scope in the cadaver hearts. So this is our perfusion model as well. And I think this really just gives you the complexity of, uh, of the neighborhood. And as, as one of the fellows once said, it's really busy down there. And I think he's right. <laughs> um, so here you have uh, a ventricular view. You have a beautiful view of the aortic valve from below. You have the uh, two cusps. You have the non-coronary and, and the left cusp. And here you have the right cusp of the aortic valve. We're going to concentrate predominantly on the mitral valve. When you look at the mitral valve, the key is um, when we're thinking about clipping it to reduce uh, mitral insufficiency is we're trying to really grab the, uh, the, the valve uh, A where it's leaking the most. And we get guidance from our, our anest cardiac anesthesiologist uh, during the procedure. And also, obviously, we're trying to avoid uh, the cords. Here you see uh, secondary cords and primary cords. And here you see very nicely uh, the papillary muscles as well. So with that, you could imagine some of the complexities that go along with doing this procedure. So the mitral, uh, the mitral clip procedure is a, it's a percutaneous procedure. We come up from the leg. This is Octavio Alfieri. He's a heart surgeon who did this procedure surgically. And um, basically what he did was sew together the anterior and posterior leaflets. And as the typical interventional cardiologist would think after that, and that was Fred Sagan-Core from California, said, boy, if you could do it with a suture, I bet you could do it with a catheter or a clip. And 
and he spent uh, really um, the next decade uh, designing um, really a percutaneous approach with, uh, with, with Octavio who had performed uh, a surgery. And here's a device, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a 10 year old device and it's really complicated and sort of uh, kludgy in a lot of ways. Here's the working end, the catheter over here, where we're at, that's the clip we actually leave. Here's the, some of the steering mechanisms and, and really um, the device hasn't changed at all o over about a decade, but what's really has changed and been really tremendous is that um, the imaging has changed. I'll show you some of that uh, when, as the talk goes along. And then what ultimately what the clip does, here you see the clip closed, but what the clip does essentially is between these, uh, we call them grasping uh, arms and the clip itself, we capture each leaflet. So you can imagine the anterior leaflet uh, going into here, the posterior leaflet going into here, and then once they're, they're caught into the, in these arms, we then close the arms like, th like this in order to uh, uh, generate the uh, approximation of the two leaflets. And it's, you know, these are sort of the, the, you know, these numbers that are probably more than, than reality, but, but it's a huge problem and, and there are a lot of patients that can be potentially treated uh, with this type of device um, as we go forward. So here's just a cartoon a representation of what we do. We come in from the, from the leg, we go across the septum, we go into the left atrium, and then once we're in the left atrium, we ultimately uh, perform the device, the pro perform the procedure. And these are the original um, um, experiences that occurred. You can see they're very creative with the names, Everest 1, Everest 2, Everest 3. Everest <laughs> but well, although the, the names have not been very creative, uh, it's been a long time. And, and when we first started doing this procedure, it, it was horrible. It took six, seven hours to, to do it, and uh, it really was a, a challenge. And uh, I think the orthopedic surgeons have done very well on the backs of interventional cardiologists <laughs> repairing their... Uh, repairing their lower spine. Uh, but it's been, um, it's been uh, quite a journey for me uh, doing this procedure over a long period of time. Initially, our goal was, um, was to do primary uh, uh, MR, primary mitral insufficiency, cord rupture, prolapse. Here you see a P2 prolapse or, or cord, cordal rupture in a cadaveric specimen. But ultimately, uh, as the device um, became commercialized, and it just recently became commercialized in the United States, you can see that the, the real benefit uh, that's accrued is really uh, for the device or for the utilization of the device has predominantly been in what we call now secondary MR um, or functional MR. And that's when the leaflets themselves are normal, but the ventricle actually pulls the leaflets apart. The trials, um, as I already mentioned, were called the Everest trials. I'll, I'll limit uh, going through them, but the original trial was a device trial comparing this mitra clip to a control or surgical uh, group. And you can see the numbers were very low. Uh, and again, this was a very early experience. But what we saw that, uh, as we'd expected uh, to be, the surgeons are terrific at primary MR. Um, they, they, they do better if you see the, the confidence intervals here. And uh, surgery is better as it, as it does not cross the line of identity. And um, when, when you look at functional, it's sort of a, you know, it crosses the line of which uh, actual procedure is better. When you look at other endpoints of um, freedom from death, uh, uh, repeat surgery, and three, four plus MR, again, when you look at primary mitral insufficiency, when it's valvular affecting the actual leaflets, uh, the surgical procedure uh, was better. Um, but uh, when you look at this functional secondary MR, you can see it crosses the line of identity. And this is a, this is a busy slide, but just to show once again that the, the lines don't diverge that much when you look at functional MR. And um, because of that, and because we know there is a surgical option, this is where we think uh, the opportunity um, is, is greatest. There have been other uh, more or less propensity type match uh, studies looking at uh, mitral valve surgery versus mitral clip. This is not the actual study itself. But what it shows is what might be expected that um, when you're doing a less invasive procedure, um, you know, the, the uh, complications are, are lower. And um, despite that, the groups are very, very close in terms of their overall uh, outcomes here, you can see at uh, six months. The Everest II also had a very high risk arm. This was the, the functional MR patients, the one whose ventricles, again, were, were secondary MR. 
And um, these were inoperable patients. And at the University of Washington, and that's really what we're treating now. We're treating secondary MR. We're treating patients who the surgeons feel are really uh, not optimal candidates for surgery. And you could see here, uh, in terms of the grade of mitral insufficiency, it's decreased uh, from the procedure. We could see we got changes in the left uh, ventricular uh, dimensions, which I think are very important as well. And so it's these types of da data points that we've been using in order to support um, uh, the consideration for this device now that's commercialized in the United States, where we think there really isn't a good surgical <laughs> option and um, doing a, um, a percutaneous approach uh, is better. And then one of the indicators that we really use in working with the heart failure team here is, is rehospitalization. So once a patient is optimally medically managed and then managed with CRT uh, in the heart from the heart failure team um, and then continues to have recurrent admissions and no longer is tolerating uh, more aggressive medical therapy, it's at that point we, we consider using uh, the mitra clip. This is a, a report out of Duke, just a propensity match uh, group looking at, at what would be expected in terms of uh, treating medically um, or, uh, or with the mitral clip. And as you can see, it doesn't reach uh, statistical significance. So my, my point in showing this slide is that I have guard, guarded optimism for this procedure as we're going forward. But right now, I think that um, we, we at least have an option for a lot of these uh, patients. So whenever there's guarded optimism or whenever there's a question about what's the best way to treat a clinical trial is, is, is the right thing to do. And, and right now there is a trial going on called the COAP trial, which is a randomized clinical trial looking at these patients who are inoperable patients who basically uh, will either get uh, mitral clip or uh, a controlled uh, therapy. And that trial is ongoing right now and uh, we hope to be uh, done with enrollment in the near uh, future. So let's go through the procedure a little bit. Um, so this is the cadaver model again. So the first thing we do is we do a transeptal puncture. So this is basically the catheter, catheter coming through from the right side to the left. And we, we do that puncture in order to get over the, uh, the mitral valve. This is a 24 French catheter, which is about eight millimeters. So it's a very big uh, catheter. Once we're above, um, we have different puncture sites depending on where we like to be. Here you can see the valve. Here you can see the device. Uh, in the heart, and here you can see the clip uh, when it's closed up. Once we uh, are where we like to be, over the jet or the worst jet, then we open up the clip, as you can see here. So we ask the, the echocardiographer to optimally show us um, that our clip arms are oriented pr properly. Obviously, if this was spun and was along the coaptation plane, we wouldn't be able to capture the leaflets at all. So this is. Uh, this is what you try to do. You try to get as best over the coaptation line. You try to be as perpendicular uh, as you possibly can. And this is how uh, sort of the procedure works. Um, so here's in the cadaver model. Again, this is the clip open. We're in the left atrium, anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet. We then ultimately drop the clip into the, uh, into the ventricle. As again, as the fellow said, it's a very busy. <laughs> Looks like someone actually said it looks like a car wash down there with these, <laughs> with these cords flopping around. Um, and then we try to get onto what's called the uh, cord-free zone. And once we're on the cord-free zone or we're in a place we like, we drop the grippers. And you saw the gripper just dropped over there. And then once the grippers drop, we close the clip and then oppose the, the anterior and posterior leaflet. So we've been doing a, a large number of those, these types of cases now at the university. And uh, we're excited to see. Uh, how uh, these procedures come out. So I'd like to say these, these uh, imaging slides are courtesy of Burkhart Mackinson, and uh, his team is just spectacular in uh, helping us uh, look at this. So this is a patient uh, with severe uh, mitral insufficiency, who, people who don't look at this all the time, left ventricle, left atrium, and then the jet you can see is going into the uh, left atrium. The density of the jet uh, uh, clearly is very dense, making it severe. Before we do the clip, we have to make sure there's no mitral stenosis. Because when you put the clip on, you're obviously reducing the size of the atrium. So here you can see um, that we, we start out, we had a mean gradient of three. We don't like to go above six. Uh, Burkhart gives us the, these ridiculously gorgeous uh, images. I, I, I really, it's, it's like, you know, I feel like I'm just like, he tells me to go left and right and I do whatever he says. Uh, so here's the catheter into the, uh, the left atrium. And then we basically 
look at the valve. And here you can see very nicely that you, you see the anterior leaflet like I showed on the cadaver model, but here you really don't see the uh, posterior leaflet very well because this is functional MR. The posterior leaflet is literally being pulled by the cords, like the cords of a parachute, into the, uh, into the left ventricle. Again, this shows the, um, the degree in, in, in regurgitation, so this will be compared to what we see uh, in some subsequent views. You can see there's a, there's a tremendous jet going back. The posterior leaflet is tethered. The, the ventricle doesn't move very well um, as we look at this. And again, this uh, showing uh, the degree of mitral insufficiency. So what the team does is, is we have what's called a Q lab. We figure out exactly where the jet is. So this, uh, this uh, type of imaging basically uh, allows us in three dimensions to know exactly where the jet is. So we say, we, I want to go a little medial or I want to go a little lateral with that clip. Once we do that, um, we then deploy the clip. So this is the first clip in place. This is a patient who required two clips. You can see we captured the anterior leaflet here. This is the, I'm sorry, the anterior leaflet here, the posterior leaflet here. Here's the aorta uh, over here. And then we look at it uh, after the first clip to make sure that we have a lot of tissue, that there's a tissue bridge, because uh, we've had cases where the actual clip will release from one of the leaflets if, if it's not, if there's not a lot of tissue uh, within the actual clip. And then this patient, because had residual uh, amount of leak, uh, we then put a second clip in. And, and the, the function of this patient was so poor, frankly, and they were used to such washout that after putting in the second clip, we developed spontaneous echo contrast. You can see here from the decreased amount of blood flow or movement in the, in the left atrium. So that was a, unusual. We had never seen that before. And then at the end of the procedure, you remember before there was tremendous amounts of mitral insufficiency. And, and here you can see, obviously, it would just been uh, reduced to almost nothing. And this is all the inflow into the left ventricle, left atrium, and left atrial appendage. So this is a, a, a woman from Alaska who uh, we feel very uh, good, gratified about, and hopefully she'll do well. And then this is just the, the 3D imaging uh, after the second clip, as you uh, can see here. <clears throat> there are problems with the procedure. So just in our cadaver model, if you, if you, you know, sometimes we feel we're caught on something. Uh, these cords are funny. Here's obviously the papillary muscles. Um, each pap goes to uh, both leaflets. But sometimes you get these, um, these sort of funny uh, tissue bridges. We've seen accessory papillary muscles. Uh, we've seen a number of different things uh, have been problematic. So by no means is, is this procedure really uh, straightforward yet. You can imagine if you opened up your clip down here and you pulled up, you'd wind up getting caught on something like that. So we continue to learn uh, about how to do this type of a procedure. Other uh, ways to approach secondary MR is to go from the coronary sinus. And this is just uh, me demonstrating on a cadaver where the coronary sinus, uh, when, when God built the heart, I think he was an interventional cardiologist. He put all these like really nice things for us to use to to move things around, so that he gave us a vein right behind the posterior leaflet. Uh, and that's all uh, collagen. It's no exoskeleton around the posterior leaflet. So there are devices now. Actually, uh, one of our colleagues, the CSP Goldberg, works uh, with a group who's looking at uh, using that procedure. Additionally, there's a company uh, that we've worked with out of Israel who has a transcatheter way, again, to instead of using the coronary sinus, go directly uh, on the annulus, uh, but this is tough. This is a really difficult procedure to do, and the mitral apparatus, uh, with due respect to the aortic valve, because you know Dr. Otto is here, is, is really complex, um, and it's a saddle shape. It's got uh, just a number of challenges in terms of, uh, of, of managing it and uh, repairing it, and um, um, it, it just uh, lends itself to uh, more of an apparatus uh, in a lot of ways with the papillary muscles and the cord. Um, one thing that uh, we've learned uh, from our TAVR experience that you can come transapical. Uh, this is just me showing the transapical approach. So instead of coming from the leg, you could actually come uh, through the apex. And here's the heart open. Here's the papillary muscle labeled. And I finally figured out why surgeons know what they're doing in the heart. It's all labeled in there. I didn't realize that beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was always wondering, how the heck are they so smart? They know everything. And then I, I finally opened this heart up, and I saw everything was labeled. So now I, now I finally get it. <laughs> um, but through that, um, there's a company just uh, up north in Vancouver, BC, who basically has developed a, uh, an approach of uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement. And I think this is really, uh, quite frankly, going to supersede uh, a lot of the devices that are out there. 
So what you do is you come in through the uh, apex of the heart. That's what's happening here. There's a catheter coming through the apex of the heart. Then the uh, catheter is opened up uh, in the left atrium. And then you can see here, and again, due to the complexity of this, um, of this uh, left atrium, um, you know, sealing is an issue. And more importantly than just sealing as an issue, um, as I mentioned, you have that left ventricular outflow tract from below, which is an issue as well. And, and you'll see that come into play. So here you can see the valve functioning. Left atrial appendage is off to your side there. And um, here's just a look at the left atrial appendage very quickly. Um, but really the action in terms of why these devices have been so difficult to develop is what's happening on the ventricular side. So these have to be somehow fixated, and when they're fixated, they wind up crawling underneath the papillary muscles or in the trabeculi, but they have a tendency to uh, block the uh, LVLT, the left ventricular outflow tract. So remember, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve uh, shares the inflow-outflow uh, of the heart, and that you can see very nicely here. So one of the main uh, sort of uh, Achilles uh, heels of, of developing these types of devices is how to A, fixate it, and B, uh, avoid uh, getting into trouble um, with the, um, with the uh, left ventricular outflow tract. So I'm going to switch gears in this uh, overview, and, and the next area I'm going to look at is the uh, left atrial appendage. Now, the left atrial appendage, if you go up to Whistler and you see all the crazy kids wearing the crazy ski hats uh, who snowboard, uh, these are the, this is where they get those designs from. Uh, it's just... It's just nuts. Uh, I, I, I don't understand where they, so, and they've been named uh, chicken wing, cactus, uh, broccoli. Uh, <laughs> I guess the interventional cardiology guys have some uh, imagination. But um, without going through the data, um, they're really the source of the majority of cardioembolic, uh, of cardioemboli during AFib. 90% uh, black shear has showed that, have, have basically come out of left atrial appendage. Um, we've occluded it, and it doesn't look like it has any harm to the, to the patient, and it's also uh, technically feasible uh, to do. So there are a number of devices. Uh, we were involved in, in the top two. Uh, the third one is only in Europe now, and, and we'll, be, we'll be investigators on the, on the bottom two here. And the names aren't that important. What is important is, is how these things work. So basically, catheter develop, you cross the, trans the septum, and then ultimately what you do uh, usually anchoring bobs you put in this PTFE coated nitinol device which basically occludes the left atrial appendage. So ideally what it does is it doesn't let blood in, more importantly it doesn't let clot out. So this is really quite uh, an, an interesting sort of device and here's just us doing it in the cadaver mile to show you how it works. So you see the blue catheter is across the septum. Um, here's the left atrial appendage. You deploy it and you can see you could really give it a good tug. And, and you, you have to oversize them by 30 or 40% because the left atrial appendage is very volume dependent. And you can see here I'm really showing off how strong I am. And uh, really giving it a good tug. And, um, and you can see it's really well fixated. You could imagine that the device uh, has to be able to sit so there's no leaks. And it's been shown that if there are some leaks, it actually could be worse. So this clots could develop as blood gets in or out. But this is essentially occluding. Uh, the left uh, atrial uh, appendage. Other devices have been developed. This is called the center heart device. And this is a device that you go um, from the pericardium, and then you have a magnet that sort of kisses or, 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 or touches uh, from the outside to the inside. And then over this, you actually uh, place a, um, a snare loop. So this is actually a patient that we, we did live to one of the major interventional courses. And um, once you have the snare loop around it, you literally um, just snare or, or, or cinch down or lasso uh, the left atrial appendage. And we did a number of these, and um, the company uh, did not uh, do a clinical uh, trial. Um, we thought they would, and, and so we abandoned the, the technique because we thought that uh, did not make, without the, uh, the appropriate randomized clinical data, uh, it didn't make sense. And this is uh, histologically what the appendage looks like when it's occluded. And as you can see here, it's not smooth on the left atrial side. This would be the left atrial side over here. And you can imagine in the presence of atrial fibrillation, this could be a nidus for clot. And there were clots um, uh, that had developed in patients. And a lot of these were Coumadin intolerant patients. Um, so, so again, we, have, we no longer do this procedure. And, uh, 
I think for maybe some of the fellows or, or junior faculty, uh, for, there are a lot of really good ideas, um, but the, you know, they just have to be proven and, and have to be worked out before we really are, are willing to uh, provide them for a large cohort of patients. So in summary, when you talk about left atrial uh, occlusion, uh, the Watchman device has the most data. It's gone to the panel, the FDA panel now three times. Actually, uh, one of the former chief of cardiology sat on the panel for the last one on the fifth. The data is interesting. Um, the, uh, the obviously, it's the, the data is against Coumadin. Uh, so it's this device versus Coumadin. So these patients don't have to take Coumadin, but the, the, the Watchman group appears to have more ischemic strokes. Obviously, the Coumadin group has more um, hemorrhagic strokes. So it's really been a, a very difficult uh, device to get approved. And it's a moving target, uh, especially with the novel uh, oral anticoagulants, the rivaroxaban, the fixabans that have come out, and obviously with the great work uh, people are doing now in uh, atrial fibrillation and ablation uh, in order to manage um, these patients. So if you ask me uh, my best guess, I think it will be approved in the next couple of months, but I think it's going to be a very, very, very limited approval. I think it's only going to be for patients who are Coumadin um, uh, intolerant or suboptimal uh, for Coumadin. So moving around the structural heart world, uh, let's go to the aortic valve. Uh, these are just some pictures of, of the aortic valve from, from the lab. Uh, this is calcific aortic stenosis. You see just this big clunk of calcium uh, right in the, uh, in the cusp of the aortic valve. And, um, what about TAVR? That's the transcatheter aortic valve replacement. What's going on in, the, in 2004? Well, I think we've proven that it's really a good alternative for high-risk patients. Uh, the original goal of TAVR was to provide a meaningful, less invasive option for high-risk uh, aortic stenosis patients. I think we've achieved that. Um, we, we really credit uh, Dr. Elaine Cribier in France. He did the first case in 2002 now, uh, but it, no one really could have predicted uh, what would happen. So a quick video of what a TAVR looks like from our cadaver model. We've been working very closely with uh, Edwards. That's the commercially available device now. We get these hearts um, from, a, from a donor site. Uh, here you can see we're above the valve. You can see quite a bit of, the first thing we do is we put a wire across the aortic valve. Once we have the wire across, this on the right is the ventricular side. We generally do a, a balloon, and I'm just going to move this ahead a little bit faster. So we do a, a balloon just to, to, to move a lot of the calcium out of the way. And here you see the balloon um, is, just, is being inflated. And so you're just pushing everything out of the way. That's what we do as interventional cardiologists. We don't cut anything out, we just push it out of the way. <laughs> and uh, here you see the balloon inflated. You're looking actually down and you can see uh, you know, the calcium and how the leaflets are pushed up against the wall. Uh, obviously, you're always worried about coronary obstruction and, and other issues. We then deflate that balloon and, and pull it out. And then once uh, that's all done, then we uh, advance the valve. And so here's the valve. It's on a, a catheter-based system. It's going to come in in a second. You'll see it more clearly. <clears throat> Here I see the, the uh, stent of the valve. It's, this one is made of cobalt chromium. Uh, you get it into position. Um, as you can see here, this big blue catheter allows you to push it because it's a very bulky device. And here you see the valve. Here you see the, uh, the balloon that the valve is expanded on. <clears throat> and once you like the position, which is challenging, we, we use CT to know exactly where we want to place it. Um, and then ultimately, you can see the calcium, then we'll blow up the balloon. And you can see the valve being expanded, the native valve being pushed out of the way. <clears throat> You're looking right down it, and then you hold it up for about five seconds. The actual calcium in the in the native valve it's what anchors the uh, what anchors the valve in place. And then once that's done, uh, you just pull out the balloon, and um, and here you can see the valve functioning very nicely. So this is uh, this is the typical procedure now we're using. So this is from below. You see a functioning valve. This procedure now takes really like almost 45 minutes. And then just as part of the work we've been doing, uh, we looked at our cadaver model and, and, and examined uh, the heart. The other valve that's been commercially available now is called the core valve. It's a little bit of a different model. It's an open model to show you. This is a nitinol-based valve. And um, this valve is self-expandable. You don't need a balloon to expand it. So I have to squirt warm water as if it was warm blood, because nitinol needs to be warmed up to expand. 
So then you position it. Here are the three leaflets behind the valve. That's me doing a, you know, a temporary pacemaker fest. <laughs> it's, it's very relaxing to do on a cadaver, by the way. <laughs> very relaxing. <laughs> and uh, once, once you've done what you need to do, you, you release the valve. Um, and, and you can see here it's in place. Um, so it's fixated. It's actually super valvular. Here's on another model with an enclosed. So one of the big issues with this valve is that the, uh, if you look from below, thank you. <laughs> this guy knows what he's doing on that lab. So if you look from below, you can see that um, the, uh, along the uh, septum, um, you have all the conduction uh, issues. So a lot of these patients run into, into problems with actual uh, conduction issues afterwards. So right now, uh, the guidelines and the recommendations are, are pretty fantastic. Uh, it's a class one indication. The heart team uh, collaborates on decisions. Um, and then it's considered a class 2A uh, in, in high-risk patients, and then a class 2A in re as a reasonable alternative to surgical uh, ABR in high-risk patients. It's really quite exciting for us. Many publications have come out uh, looking at, at the data. Uh, this is the high-risk population. It, it, some people say it almost has the effect of penicillin uh, for people who are inoperable. Remember, this is the inoperable standard therapy is medical therapy, not surgical therapy. And this is the TAVR. You can see the, the delta, the absolute is uh, 26%. So it's a very significant uh, difference. This is the core valve data. I just bring this up. I don't want to throw out too much data. But this is against surgery. Uh, and this is one year all ca cause mortality. You can see that the transcatheter uh, systems have demonstrated superiority at a, at a, at a p-value of 0.04. All stroke actually um, has gotten better. One of the Achilles heels of this device is always uh, stroke, and so he's been concerned. So really, I think uh, it's real, that's one of the, a, a real uh, opportunity that's occurred. The second is the, is the heart team concept. Um, now we have the patient in the middle, and uh, we have the cardiologist, the imaging specialist, the anesthesiologist, the consultant. This is the surgeon. I don't know why it didn't come out. It's interesting. <laughs> That's fortuitous, or not fortuitous, or something. Uh -oh. It's not going to have a happy ending, this talk. So, uh, oh, gosh. Um, I'll change that to black on the next time. I'm, Bill, next time you're inviting me, I'll fix that. Um, so really, uh, it's just a great group. And a lot of my, um, not my team, but our team, I mean, this is a puzzle with, with colleagues and people we work with. And just a, a huge number of people, uh, many who are in the audience now, work together to make sure that these patients are, are well taken care of. And it really is uh, critically uh, important to do that. There's been rigorous research, and I think this is why the FDA has approved a lot of these devices uh, early on. And, um, and I think that um, you know, we have now what's called a TBT registry with over 7,000 patients. Um, we have a very robust system now uh, within the United States to pick the right sites, who can and who cannot do this. Um, it's actually fairly difficult to be trained in these procedures. So we, we're always looking for good structural heart fellows, so uh, let us know if you're interested. But uh, if you want to get out there and do it, it's, it's really uh, important to get a lot of training early on to have, have a, a really uh, terrific opportunity. Here you see a lot of the commercial sites really clustered in the, in the high uh, population uh, areas. This is where valves are being done. But I think in Washington State, um, there's only a, a few centers. And uh, fortunately, we're able to provide these to our patients. When looking at these registries, um, with not really going into them uh, very, very um, closely, all I can say that overall, the trends are better. Uh, we're better at mortality. We're better at stroke. And I think that's just the factor of experience. It's, it's really as uh, straightforward as that. Um, you can see here that the strokes are better. Uh, you can see other complications um, and vascular complications just continue to get better and better over time uh, as we compare uh, our early experience uh, with, the, uh, with the later uh, experience. When you look at the durability, <coughs> it's always been a big question with bioprostheses. Um, it looks right now that we have reasonably good durability. Obviously, we're not out uh, many, many years, but um, you know, almost a decade for some patients, and uh, um, it looks like we have terrific durability. At least our, uh, our cohorts here at the University of Washington, I think we've only seen one or two issues with uh, durability in our valves. The Vancouver experience, where all this started right up the coast, uh, really they have patients out for nine years, um, and you can see here um, just uh, really uh, spectacular results uh, as we best know it. 
One of the controversies, um, one of the controversies is how low risk do we go? I mean, who should we do this on? Can we do this on anybody? If you look at what's happened in the trials, uh, the SPS score, that's how we, we judge uh, how sick the patients are, um, continue to get lower and lower. The risk in the TBT registry right now is about 5%. So we're moving into uh, lower and lower risk cohorts. And, you know, so you think to yourself, when you turn 70 to 75, even if you could be operated on, uh, do you want to be operated on? Would you prefer to get this? But I think this, this table really, um, really shows that there's a group that's, that's futile, and I think from an economic standpoint, that's important. Then you have your TAVAR group, which I think are great. Then you have your sort of patients that can go either way. Then there's the intermediate risk, which is being studied. And then the low risk, um, I think really at some level it's, it's almost irresponsible because um, surgery is, is terrific for these patients. And, and our surgeons here do a spectacular job. So we work closely with them and, and we, work, we, we make those decisions with, with, the, with all of them. The Achilles heel of this procedure is paravalvular leak. When you put these things in, you saw how they were ballooned up, but around the implant that we put, uh, occasionally or um, probably a certain, almost 10% of the time, you'll get some leak around it. And why do you get a leak? And the reason you get a leak is this. So here you have, you're in the ventricle, and you're taking a valve, and you want it to oppose all of this area very, very closely. But in reality, it's very hard to do that. And as we say in New York, you get gutters. <laughs> That's a good New York term there. There's the gutters. So this is a big piece of calcium. This is the ventricular, this is the ventricular side. Here's the anterior leaf of the mitral valve. All the calcium is here. And you can see that uh, these are areas where uh, blood could go around the valve. And when you get this situation, uh, it's quite significant because we know that even with uh, trace or mild, I'm sorry, mild uh, insufficiency, the mortality is higher. So during the procedure, we really spend an amazing amount of trying, time to try to very carefully uh, understand how much leak is left. And, and we'll do things like put a, a bit of another balloon in to pose it better. Uh, we'll make valve choices a little bit on this as well. So these are very, very important uh, issues. Strokes, if you ask these old people what they care about most, they don't care about dying. They're just worried about having strokes. Um, and um, we know that the stroke rate at 30 days does exist in the more recent core valve data. It's gotten a lot better, but it continues to exist. In, and we're going to be doing a, a study uh, looking at um, the, the, how to improve the overall stroke rate. And important it is to say that, that you know, these devices go over the arch of the aorta near the great vessels. And I think a lot of where the strokes are occurring is uh, during the uh, transition of these devices. And then finally is the procedural considerations. Um, right now we do it under general anesthesia, um, and it's, it's quite uh, uh, an ordeal. But uh, <laughs> I love that lady, wherever she is. She's, she's in more slides than, than anybody I've ever seen. But, um, but right now, uh, the strategy in Van Vancouver is, uh, is multidisciplinary, multimodality, and minimalist. So they're discharging patients the next day. So could you imagine you know, thinking about that in the, in the context of what, you know, as you live through this, that someone could get their, their heart valve replaced and be discharged literally uh, the next day. And this is one of our colleagues from uh, up north, and we're very lucky to work uh, closely with them. So future directions, the last few slides. Uh, we have new valves. This one uh, is the direct flow valve. We'll be testing that uh, in the University of Washington. Jamie McCabe will be the, the PI on that. This is the Sadra valve. We're going to have uh, Creighton Don's going to be the PI on that. So with our colleagues, we've already tested this, the Sapien 3. Uh, and these are all better designs, uh, repositionable, and a lot of little nuances to make them better. These are other devices that uh, are coming down the road. We put them uh, around the arch of the aorta to protect the patient. Uh, we'll be uh, testing this at the University of Washington in a few weeks. Uh, it's a filter that goes into the carotid, so if any debris does come off the valve, we're able to catch it without any problem. So in conclusion, I hope you agree with me. This is an exciting environment for medical device uh, therapies, critical to get the evidence-based medicine that, that goes along with all this. Cost is a, a huge issue, and, and I'm sure a lot of the thinking in this room is how are we going to pay for this? The, the uh, Tavar valves are about $30,000. The, uh, the Mitra clip is $35,000 each, um, a lot of money. Uh, training of physicians is, is a big, big issue. And um, you know, fortunate at the university, we have these programs available. 
And then uh, even not only just training how to do the procedures, but how do we recreate our education system for fellows and residents so we don't create a lot of redundancy in our education. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> <laughs> That was a really interesting talk. And Thank you. To, thinking outside this medical center, you know, one of the histories of devices in general, but cardiac devices and PCI would be a good example where, you know, initially they showed, you know, great benefit, but that in general use they probably got overused in circumstances that they weren't necessarily clinically uh, warranted. So what are your thoughts about as these technologies sort of get proven and move out to, you know, what, here we have the heart team, but are there specific criteria or decision-making methods that you think ought to be used in sort of determining how these uh, get put in? Because obviously there are incentives once somebody's learned how to do them to maintain competence and, mm -hmm. you know, put them in. No, it's, it's a great question. So the question, you know, just to repeat, is just uh, how do we control the, uh, the behavior at some level. Uh, so the national um, um, decisions that have been made uh, in order to uh, uh, release these devices are, are based also on participation in these registries. So I'm hoping these registries will, will control behavior. And I think that's why even the FDA has been a little bit more liberal in, uh, in, in doing that. So at the end of the day, the national coverage decisions, which is how we get paid, how the hospitals get paid, the physicians get paid, I think will ultimately dictate that. Uh, but your point about PCI is, is spot on, and these devices are a lot more uh, expensive and difficult to use. Okay. Here, I, Mark, I, I, again, that was a really nice overview. I just have, I have, I have one quick factual question, one more complex one. How do you have the cadaver hearts continue to beat? <laughs> <laughs> Strong hands. Okay. <laughs> That's, that's, what, that's what I very thought. very technical. <laughs> very well done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so m more more com complex question. The the you know, the the issue of uh, functional or secondary MR. You know, there's obviously a lot of patients out there with it, and and you know my understanding is that surgery has not really clearly been shown to be beneficial. Uh, in that population because they're, presumably because their their disease is based on some other type of heart disease that is the prominent driver of their prognosis. So that when you compare the MitraClip to surgery for secondary MR, you're really comparing it to something the efficacy of which is very uncertain. How, how are we going to get definitive answers in a trial like that? Right. So no, that's a great point. So within the Everest trial, um, the functional group was not very uh, large. Um, it, was, it was mostly primary degenerative. Um, and I think that the, the feeling right now for these high-risk groups is that surgery is a suboptimal option. And, um, and originally, so let me answer it first. The, co there will be the, the COAP trial is going, I think, to believe it, to, to answer that. That's against medical therapy. So originally in the COAP trial, the idea was that um, the surgeon had to turn down the patient. Um, and then it was then you could randomize the medical therapy or the device. But it's not, as you said, a surgical valve problem. It's a heart failure problem. So what we've done is change the trial. And so now it's the heart failure doctor who ultimately determines and says, I've exhausted everything. I'm done. I can't do anything else. Um, I've maximized CRT uh, medical therapy. Now I'm ready. And, and the patient has had a hospitalization within six months. And so that's the randomization. I don't think there's going to be a comparator to surgery uh, at this point unless the, the surgical data uh, demonstrates uh, a, an accrued benefit that we have not seen in not terrific trials, but at least what we've seen in, in retrospective data and uh, mostly retrospective data. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh.